hit a round number. This is episode 50 of the Shutdown Inning Podcast. I am Steven Risotto, alongside, as always, who has been alongside uh, me for 50 episodes on this journey. My partner in crime on the Shutdown Inning, it is Tyler Hall. Tyler, what's going on? Hey, hey, everybody. Yeah, episode 50, we made it. I remember our first guest, Andrew Pasquini, uh, who we'll be seeing tomorrow, by the way. But he told us, you know, we'd be at 100 episodes in no time, and we're halfway there. Look at us go. You know what we should do with Andrew is that, and you know, for... For those wanting to know why we're going to see Andrew, uh, we're going to an A's game with a bunch of people, uh, and Andrew's one of them. And uh, we should do like a little intro and go, I'm Andrew Pasquini, and you're listening to the Shutdown Inning Podcast. And that'd be pretty cool. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to give a little feedback to uh, Stephen and I have been in this group chat of mostly Giants fans for years now, like six, seven years, if not longer. And we have one token Dodgers fan, uh, and he's making the trip up. Up. He hasn't seen the Coliseum and the Dodgers are in town, so he wants to see it before the A's move away. And so we're all rallying around our Dodgers fan friend, Joey. We're not going to root for the Dodgers, but we're going to get to uh, see him and about a dozen of our other friends and, and have a good time at the Coliseum. Yes, absolutely. Shout out to Joey. Going to be good to see him. Going to be good to see everybody. Going to be good to see you. I, I feel like I, I'm seeing you more frequent, which is a good thing. You yeah, know? it's awesome. Man. Quick question. Do you think this will be your last game at the Coliseum? No, I know it's not actually, um, because and real quick, I could shout out. Um, so last year, for those that don't know, and we might have touched on it on a podcast, um, I won the A's scholarship, uh, the A's journalism scholarship, the Bill King uh, journalism scholarship, um, and it helped pay for the last semester of college for me. It was a big honor. Got honored on the field, held up the big check, which was actually a whiteboard, so I don't have the check. Unfortunately, right after I walked off the field, I witnessed them erase it. Um, and this year we have back-to-back -back S of State winners, so I want to shout out Kathia Noriega for winning it. A uh, very cool accomplishment. Uh, she was getting it. It was actually she was deciding between this weekend and the twenty-first of August, and she decided on the twenty-first of August. So I will be back in Oakland on that day. So just a quick shout out, some some housekeeping to get out of the way. So congrats to Kathia. She is an aspiring uh, sports sports journalist. She was actually, she shadowed me twice in the press box a few weekends ago, and she's on her way to do some, some really big things in the industry. So shout out. That's awesome. Congrats. Yeah, this might be my last game. I might try to go to the uh, the last Bay Bridge series game, which is uh, a couple Sundays from now. But uh, we'll see. That's to be determined. So this potentially is my last time at the Coliseum. Grew up there, going there a lot as a kid. Uh, you know, when you're a little kid, baseball's baseball. And if the Giants were out of town, we went to an A's game. So spent a lot of time there as a kid. So, um, but. Enough of that. We need to talk trade deadline, Stephen. There were some transactions, some players moving around the league. Yeah, absolutely. And Sacramento has acquired the Oakland A's. No, uh, <laughs> that that is a trade deadline move that will happen next year. But yeah, this is a fun time of year. I know you and I always have fun keeping up with the headlines. And um, I was on vacation when all this happened. So like I was in Reno for a few days, Sacramento in a few days, and it was fun kind of keeping up with with uh, what was going on, but uh, I think we always like seeing new guys in new uh, uh, guys in new uniforms, uh, especially when they get traded to a contender, um, especially guys that have never been in a postseason hunt before. Uh, it's it's an opportunity for those guys to get their feet wet in some pennant race baseball, and always a good time of year. But there were a lot of deals made. I know we were talking a little bit uh, before we came on here about. The amount of relievers that were traded, it seemed like the relief market was hitting. Uh, it seemed like there's a lot of good outfielders that were traded, and uh, there's definitely a few that uh, we plan to touch on here. Yeah, we're not going to touch on all those trades. Otherwise, this would be like a four-hour episode, but we're going to gonna hit probably like seven or eight of the, the main deals that happened. And, and I mean, the first one that kind of uh, surprised me, at least with the timing of it, I think it was four or five days before the deadline, Randy Arozarena, uh, rumored to be on the move for a while. He finally went to the Pacific Northwest to the Mariners. Uh, you know, I, I could see that being a, a pretty good fit. He's really, he started out really slow this year, but he's turned it on since I think about June 1st. So the last couple months he's been uh, raking all night, all night day year again. So uh, what were your thoughts on that deal? 
yeah, uh, like you said, the first one to kind of really go down and he struggled, but he's still a guy that's going to help an offense. Um, and like, not just help an offense, but when he gets hot, he's one of those guys that could carry an offense. And we saw it in October. He's one of like, you know, you might not think of it. You, you might not think of him in this way, but he's one of the top current October performers that we have in baseball. So if the Mariners find a way to get into October, I'd imagine all eyes will be on Randy or Rosarena. Um, but yeah, no good move for Seattle. They're always kind of, you know, they've always kind of had a good relationship trading wise with Tampa Bay. It seems like their players are like always, I don't know. It seems like a Mariner has usually played for the Rays and a Ray has usually played for the Mariner Mariners. So it's kind of interesting to think of it that way, but he's already got a home run in Seattle. He's off to a good start uh, at the time of this recording. He's uh, six for 19 uh, with a couple of walks. So yeah, a good guy to have in a lineup. And I think even more than a good guy to have in a lineup, a good energy to have around the team. So, um, and Tampa Bay, like, what does this mean for them? Like they're, they're all in, in, in terms of selling, or they were all in, in terms of selling and, um, you know, at some point you got to look at your standings or your, your place in the standings and the Rays above 500 probably don't have a shot at the division with Baltimore and New York kind of, you know, going neck and neck and, um, the wild card a little bit different. There's a bunch of teams in there. So uh, they're trying to maximize the most out of what they could get for some of their guys. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's funny kind of about this deal is Tampa's only a game behind the Mariners right now in the Mm -hmm. wild card. So it just kind of shows the difference in approach that some teams might have when they're neck and neck in the standings. Um, But yeah, I I agree. I think, you know, Randy will be a good guy to have just around the team. He's a, a positive guy. They need some energy. Uh, Julio Rodriguez has been underperforming and he's currently banged up and their, their rotations really been carrying that team. So they need to put some runs up on the board uh, to support that, that, uh, that rotation. I believe that their staff is, yeah, it's given up the least amount of runs in the American league, second least in baseball behind only the Braves. So they need to start putting some runs on the board. And then but before we transition to the next one, I know you and I talked about it. It was really cool after the day after Rosarena got traded, the Rays had a day game. So he stuck around and sat in the stands at Tropicana Field for a few uh, innings. Uh was seen like w- doing a lap around the stadium, high-fiving fans. Um, you know, I went to Tampa earlier this year and I kind of touched on it, I think in a previous episode when we talked about my trip, but he is like so amazing with the fans you know he would come out and if you called his name he'd look up at you and you could like yell something to him and he'd wave he'd bring extra balls out between innings for warm-ups just so he could throw extra balls to kids so you know anytime you can add that kind of energy to an organization it's not going to be a bad thing yeah and when he walked off when he left he you know all the fans came up to him and he was there he was there for it so really cool He, he, he does seem like a really good guy and baseball needs a lot of entertainers and he's definitely one of them and uh, he has a lot of fun with with what he does. So, yeah. um, and you mentioned the thing about the Rays kind of not being too far out of the wild card hunt. It's like there's just so many teams that are just in the middle, you know, and and they don't know what to do. And you know, it, it's nice. To, we'll get into what the Giants did, but it's nice to see a team that kind of made a decision. So there's a little yeah. teaser for <laughs> for what's to come. Yeah, and and you mentioned baseball needs entertainers. Perhaps one of the more, most entertaining players in baseball, Jazz Chisholm Jr., he went on the move uh, up to the Bronx, and he has just been on a tear since since donning the pinstripes. Oh God, he's been he's been insane. He's hit, you know, four homers and I think back to back multi homer games uh, for Jazz Chisholm yep. in in Philadelphia. Um, you know, just a burst of energy and. <laughs> You know, Jazz Chisholm's an interesting case because, you know, there's a lot of fans of teams that maybe didn't want to see their team trade for him because, you know, there's there's kind of a census around Jazz Chisholm Jr. that the name and the aura kind of outweigh the actual performance. And maybe he's a bit overrated. He hasn't performed. Uh, he's not really healthy a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, all of that might be true, but he's still a young player. He's still a guy who is kind of in the midst of, of his physical prime. And there's some guys that just need the motivation. And I don't think Miami was giving it to him. And I think, you know, he's going to thrive in a big market in New York. Like he is the guy that's going to thrive under the lights, under the big pressure. Uh, he first day he walked in with backwards hat. Um, 
he's going to be fine in New York. Like this is a place that was built for him. He was built for them. Um, you know, some of the very high personality guys, they just thrive in, in a bigger, bigger atmosphere. So uh, I think he's going to be great. I think he's going to find a lot of juice in New York and I could honestly see him being there for a long time, but he's done really well. Yeah. He's, he's been on fire for them. And I agree. I mean, the bright lights, the big crowds, you know, that just brings out the best in some guys. And I could definitely see a guy with like the flair and the swagger of, of jazz really thriving in the Bronx. And, and you mentioned, you know, the backwards hat, he wore like a green belt, you know, a lot of people have been up in arms, you know, cause the Yankees are usually a buttoned up franchise and people have just called him out for it. You know, not everybody, but I've seen quite a few and just, why is it okay for every other team, but not the Yankees get over yourselves. You're already not doing a city connect. Let your players have some fun. Yeah. They can't even have beards. I mean, just, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a, I understand like there's, it's a storied franchise and people like the tradition of the New York Yankees, but you know what you're getting when you make that trade, <laughs> you yeah. know, as a fan base, you know, as a front office, you know, as a team, we're getting jazz Chisholm and, and jazz Chisholm. He's not the type of guy that's going to, that's going to be, um, you know, the, the, the standard average Joe in a Yankee clubhouse. Um, yep. he's not going to be that in any clubhouse. He wasn't that in the Marlins clubhouse and Miami fans liked him. Um, he, he doesn't fit the mold maybe of what the Yankees like historically have done, but the bright lights of New York, he is going to thrive there. I, I, it's going to be good, but I agree. I think the, the whole, or, the whole, you know, image around the New York Yankees, like, it's got to start to change a little bit and we got to start to get some, some entertainers back in New York because they have a history of enter- Babe Ruth played in New York. He is the most entertaining baseball player of his time, maybe of all time. Just like people went to the ballpark to watch him do something that they've never seen before. So the history is there, but you know, it, it's kind of been lost by some of the Steinbrenner esque rules and traditions and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, unrelated to the trade deadline, but you mentioned how the Yankees can't even have beards. Did you see what happened? They had a Phil Bickford. Uh, this was a couple weeks ago. Made him cut his hair, shave his facial hair. He was on the team for like three days, and then they cut him. So they made him like completely change his appearance for like three days. I like how you said that they cut him. Yeah. <laughs> so he he cut he himself. Cut, <laughs> yeah, and then they cut him. Oh man, yeah, that's just rough. I mean, I. That's just and the guys with the long hairs and the long beard, like there's a reason a lot of guys just have that throughout their career. It's like it hair is a personal thing, you know? Yeah. Hair is a personal thing. And uh Yeah, like I, why is a mustache okay, but not a beard? What I, are we doing? I don't even know. None of them do <laughs> a mustache, really. Yeah. Yeah, but uh yeah, speaking of of you know, cutting the the Padres did a lot of cutting to their top prospects in order to acquire two relievers, uh Jason Adam also from the Rays. We talked about them selling quite a bit and and Tanner Scott from the Marlins, they basically uh, took the best relievers in the state of Florida. But they traded a ton of their farm. Let me get back down to that list. Um it it was half of their top 10, according to uh, Baseball America, uh, as well as their number 12, uh, Homer Bush Jr., and then number their number 29 prospect as well. So seven of their top 30 prospects to get two relievers. And, and a lot of people thought they should be targeting starters with the injuries to you, Darvish, and, and Joe Musgrove. So, you know, th- their bullpen is, you know, one of the best in baseball now, but we'll see how that plays out for them and and down the line. I mean, I don't know. Somehow the Padres always seem to be a team that has these prospects to trade and, and acquire guys, um, you know, like the Soto deal a couple of years ago, and then they traded him and got some prospects back. But they uh, definitely uh, emptied the farm a bit to, to shore up that bullpen. AJ Preller is a madman. I mean, this is what he does. He's a madman. We've seen it for off seasons and deadlines in the past. And the one interesting thing about this is like, we've heard so much that the Padres have made enough of these moves that they don't have a system, a farm system to deal with. And that could be like true. Like the top 10 guys that they did have maybe probably weren't as good as top 10 guys that other teams have. I I didn't look at the rankings. I haven't kept up with the prospect rankings, but still their top 10 guys in their estimation um, for relievers, for relief pitchers. And one thing I do understand, and I guess I do appreciate to an extent, is that 
the Padres had a really tough time last year in close games late in the games. I think I think the extra inning game, like their extra inning, their um their record in extra innings was awful. And I think they finally got their final their, their first extra inning win like the last part of the year sometime in September. So they were not good late in the game. They're giving up a lot of runs. Um, like I remember when, you know, feeling very confident with the Giants offense against some of those guys in the Padres bullpen multiple times. Uh, so it is good to add on to that. And, you know, Tanner Scott's a guy who um, was looked at as probably the best reliever on the market. Jason Adam has made an all-star team. Um, but it, it's it's a it's a lofty, lofty price that they paid for those guys. And I will say this about the Padres. I don't want to say the Dodgers are going to get overtaken this year. I don't think that's the case. But the Padres are in a really good spot because the Dodgers are not as good as I think a lot of people thought. They have some injuries of their own. They have some pitching issues of their own. And they're not going to be the 120-win team that we saw. And San Diego's only four and a half games back. Now, there's still a lot of losing the Dodgers have to do and winning the Padres have to do. Um, And I, I would never at this point say the Dodgers won't win the division. But if you want some competition, there's some building competition and the Padres are not shying away from it. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, the Padres are sitting in a wild card spot right now. Uh, and like you said, four and a half out in the in the division. Uh, and also, you know, I, I just pulled up their contracts. Jason Adam has two more years of arbitration eligibility, so they'll have him for a while <laughs> at least. Uh, Scott is a free agent after this year. So one's a rental, one's not. So they're still building for their future there, at least with Adam. And uh, yeah, you know, two relievers, four first names. You know, how could you pass up that opportunity? Never trust them. Never trust the guy with two first names is what they say. Jordan Elliott. That's the first one yeah. in the mind. <laughs> um, yeah. So we'll see how that shakes out. Uh, the, I mean, the Padres seem to be on their, on their way to a, a playoff appearance. So we'll see if uh, the, the bullpen was the way to go for them. Yeah. Um, and that you mentioned Tanner Scott being the, the best reliever available the best that that at least moved was probably Isaac Paredes from the uh, from the Rays, another Rays trade uh, going to the friendly confines of Wrigley Field. Uh, Morrell was part of this deal and it was actually crazy. Like he was playing in a game for the Cubs when the trade happened. They had to pull him in the middle of an of an inning, I believe. Um, but you know the the Cubs are are hanging around the hunt as well. Uh, they're five and a half out, so they're they're of the of the last wild card, so they're trying to get into it, uh, adding the the best bat on the market is a good way to go about that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and it's funny because Morrell, I believe he was playing a lot of third base. He might've been even their everyday third baseman. So essentially like it was a swap third baseman for third baseman. Um, and I think there were some if... prospects going from the Cubs as well. Yeah, it's true. Um, cause Paredes is, is probably more impactful. Um, but Paredes, like a lot of people don't know him. Um, and, and he's kind of unknown, but he's a really, really good hitter. Um, he's had a few years now of just above average offensive seasons. There's a 30 home run season in there. Um, he's a guy who's going to have good plate discipline, put the bat on the ball, just a good hitter. Uh, and he's going to hit well in Chicago. And, um, you know, the Cubs are another one of those teams where it's just like, we don't know we don't know where they stand, but this is also kind of a buy sell move only because again, Paredes is only 26 years old and they could have him for the future. They could extend up. They could do kind of whatever. Uh, Cause they're not making the playoffs. I don't think um, even though they're what six out of the wild card, uh, but you know, they're in last place in the central. They got to leapfrog all those central teams and some of the teams in the West in the east so I, I i don't see it happening for the cubs but it's a good move for their future um and it 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 does make a little bit of sense even though it's not one of those moves where like the impactful players going to a cont- uh, contender but i think the cubs are a team where like every year they seem to fluctuate on what they have and what they don't have because i think every year it seems like the the central tends to fluctuate like st louis has a bad year the cubs have a good year the cubs barely miss they come back better next year. Like it's always fluctuating in that division, but good move. I like Paredes. I think he's really underrated. 
And Hugwatch. Yeah. We saw Hugwatch. We never really see like Hugwatches anymore. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. That that's uh because usually now I think the trend is like if there's any indication that a deal might get done, it's like he's not even playing that day. But you know, Morel was in the lineup and we got to see the hugs and you know, it doesn't take an idiot or it doesn't take a smart person to know that, you know, what that what's happening in the dugout when you're hugging a guy in the third inning coming off the yeah. field in the middle of an inning. Yep. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see. I mean, one thing I noticed too, is, you know, there is starting to get, there's some, uh, some distance building now between the three teams in the national league that are currently in the wild card spots and the rest of those teams. So it'll be, uh, interesting to see how some of those like the cubs you know they like you mentioned lots of teams to hop so more of a future deal than a this year deal i would imagine uh next up we wanted to talk about the the houston astros uh, by most accounts completely overpaying for uh kikuchi from from tampa or sorry from toronto wrong t name there but uh i mean kikuchi he's been kind of up and down his whole career and so the the Astros gave up their number two, number five, and number 19 prospect for Kikuchi. I just don't see him being a, a difference maker of that caliber for the for the Astros. Yeah, it makes you kind of wonder. And, and by the way, you said up and down. Uh, a few weeks ago, Kikuchi was a down on this very podcast for uh, for trucking Tyler Soderstrom, the first baseman for the A's. Um, <laughs> but uh it kind of makes you wonder like where the starting pitching market was and how involved the Astros were maybe in a guy like Flaherty, maybe in a guy like Blake Snell. Um, you know, I'd like to wonder what other options there were because it did seem like a little bit of an overpay. Uh, Kikuchi's a guy pitching in Toronto, you know, a hitter's ballpark granted, but he's also going to another hitter's ballpark in, in Houston uh, where balls just get hit out of there at a crazy rate, especially right-handed hitters who have the short porch in left field, and Kikuchi is a left-handed. So it is it is a, a weird trade per se, but he's still striking guys out. I think they like his ability to, you know, to, to get swing and misses. He's still throwing hard from what I remember him pitching against the Giants. Um, but I don't think he's your game one guy. Uh, and usually at the deadline, that's kind of what you try and go for. Um, maybe a little bit, but I think he's going to be a solid piece, but I, I don't know if it was enough to match what they gave up. Like Framber Valdez is still there. I know they like what Blanco's given them. Hunter Brown had a rough start to the year. He's kind of been back now. Um, and then you slide Kikuchi in there. It could work out, but um, there's still not that like one guy to go with Valdez at the top of the rotation. Um I don't know if Blanco's it. He might be. He's got a sub three ERA, but I thought they would have looked nice with with Blake Snell atop the rotation. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll probably talk Snell a bit more momentarily, but uh, yeah, I agree. There, I think there were some better pieces they could have acquired, at least for what they they gave up. Uh, and to kind of stick up in uh, in Canada, the next thing was just how the the Blue Jays did a great job selling without fully selling you know all year we've heard oh will they trade vlad jr will they trade bichette i feel like the vlad chatter kind of died down over time but bichette was still a guy that was getting talked about he has been dinged up recently so maybe that made him a little more difficult to move but uh you know they they moved about eight major leaguers uh yimmy garcia danny jensen jansen kevin kiermeyer kikuchi Isaiah Kinnerfalefa, Nate Pearson, who a few years ago was like one of the top pitching prospects in baseball, uh, Trevor Richards, and then Justin Turner also went up to uh, to the Mariners, and and for that they got about they got about fifteen prospects. Seven of those were ranked in the top uh, top twenty of the teams that they got them from. They were in the top twenty of their their rankings. So, you know, I think that's a pretty solid job of of selling off some pieces, building for your future without fully gutting your major league roster of, yeah, of and, star power. Yeah, no, this is no, that's a good point. And and I think like and I mentioned how like I would prefer teams to pick a side. Um, 
And like, there's some teams that just stand pat and hold on to their pieces, even though they do have tradable pieces. And in this case, the Blue Jays did with Guerrero and Bichette. Like that's a very, those are two very good pieces. And I, I think Bichette especially is a guy that, you know, I, I think both of them actually could have moved. Um, but the Blue Jays are also a team. And I mentioned how the NL Central fluctuates. I think the East in the American League fluctuates too. So they're kind of in a way leaving a spot open. Like people don't know this, or maybe the average fan doesn't know this, but Toronto's a big market. They could sign free agents. They were heavily involved in the Otani sweepstakes. Um, they probably could have matched, you know, maybe not the creativity that the Dodgers matched, but they probably could have matched like whatever the highest offer in a traditional contract would have been, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I think they're not worried about like, you know, building this team, they, they traded a lot of guys that they have on their big league roster, like you said. And, um, this is kind of how you do it, like without completely rebuilding. Uh, it, it's a good example. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of the guys that they have in there, like who are kind of no name guys, like the Davis Schneiders, the Ernie Clements, uh, Spencer Horwitz, like we saw them in San Francisco. They're not like awful. Uh, these are like nice little players yeah. that they could, you know, fill in for the future. Um, and when you get 15 prospects back, you are elevating your chances of like three of those guys making an impact. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, that that's the way to do it. And uh, I don't think anybody would have argued if they were to trade Bichette and Guerrero too. Um, but this is not a hundred loss team. They're just not very good this year. And they think they could probably run it back next year. And it's still like, again, it still hasn't shut the door on a deal to trade Guerrero and Bichette. Like there's still the off season. Maybe those are more off season deals than deadline deals, but the door's not shut on more moves to be made for Toronto. I don't think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, but I think for the approach at the deadline and how they kind of threaded that needle of selling without you know, gutting their team that I think they had one of the most successful, at least the most out of a team that sold, they probably had the most successful, uh, uh, trade deadline in my yeah, eyes for sure and, and like you met just really quick i mean orioles yankees red sox rays jays like all of those like you mentioned that's kind of the one where maybe you're not in it this year you're in it next year all those teams have made the playoffs in the last few years so you know come back next year let's see what happens uh but a team that doesn't go away from the playoffs the los angeles dodgers we've talked about them a little bit uh they got the at least the, the probably the top Pit, uh, starting pitcher that moved in in Jack Flaherty from the Detroit Tigers. Um, you mentioned their starting pitching woes earlier uh, with some injuries. And so, you know, I think as far as what they needed and the holes they needed to, to try to plug, going out and getting the, the top line starter that was available is uh, you got to be happy if you're uh, down in Los Angeles. Yeah, Flaherty's been really good, and, you know, I kind of briefly mentioned the Dodgers pitching woes, and, you know, you mentioned it. Like, it's just they they don't have the depth in their pitching that I think they thought they would have had. There's been just a lot of guys that have been hurt. Uh, they're just getting hit in the head with a lot of these, like, season-ending injuries for their pitchers, and Dustin May is out. Walker Bueller's back on the shelf. Um, you know, the list kind of goes on and on. And y Yamamoto. Yamamoto's out. Hershaw just came back and even he's kind of a, a guy that's a shell of himself, which was to be expected. Um, you know, that's and then, pretty, did you see that his last start against the Padres was his, his first career start where, where he didn't record a strikeout. I did not know that. I did not see that. So yeah, different guy, right. Different yeah. pitcher, different, different pitcher, you know, going to figure out ways to get guys out. And I think he's been working towards this for a few years, but um, the Dodgers needed someone and Flaherty's 28 years old has battled through health and consistencies and, uh, does not have a history like recently of like high workload, um, years. And like, this could easily be a guy that they bring back for future seasons. And it's like, he's kind of a pain. Like he, he's someone that could be on lock. Like there's certain pitchers that like came up big prospects and then they get a few years in the league. And then it's like, God, what happened to them? And then they come into an organization and they get unlocked. Now, Jack Flaherty could be a guy that's unlocked. Uh, had a great year with Detroit this year. Um, he's striking out guys at a clip at a clip that he's never struck them out at before. Um, home runs are down. Walks are down. Walks are significantly down. Um, so he 
kind of looks like a different pitcher and it's a big move for the Dodgers because they needed they needed a reliable veteran arm that could get them through um the season because you know they're they're banged up. Yeah. I believe he's a free agent after this year, but you're right. If if he's a guy they lock up for a few years after this, I mean, if they're even relatively healthy, you're talking about Flaherty as like your fourth or fifth starter because you're gonna assume that Otani's gonna pitch next year, Yamamoto, Bueller, Glass now. Glass now. So I mean and then like a mix of like one of those guys that they always have, whether it be like Bobby Miller or yeah, um, if May can stay healthy one May, year. <laughs> yeah, Kershaw always signs the one year deals. I'm, I'm blanking on that other guy, um Sheenan or no, um uh, blanking on his name. Ed Ed Sheeran. No, it's not Ed Sheeran. Ed, Ed Sheenan, yeah. Gets yeah. confused with Ed Sheeran a lot, I imagine. Yes. Um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, the D- Dodger's going to Dodger. So, you know, of course, they went out and get, you know, the biggest uh, fish they can for their hole. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Should note that the Yankees, like, tried to get Flaherty, but something came up, I guess, in the physical, and that kind of scared them off. And the Yankees did not end up getting an arm, if I'm not mistaken. So Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, Flaherty is a guy, like you mentioned, you know, he ha- has had some injury woes in the past. I think he's had TJ uh he's missed a couple chunks of time previous in his career so we'll see how it how it shakes out for the the doyers um but then we got to talk the san francisco giants and what they did slash didn't do at this deadline i mean i'm gonna let you lead it off you cover this team what were your thoughts on the deadline and, and what the giants did yeah, I mean, it's so hard to be in the middle. It's it's the worst place to be is in the middle. Um, nobody wants to be there, whether it be in the off season, you know, finishing up a five hundred year. Nobody wants to be there at the trade deadline. Nobody wants to be in the middle at five hundred. It's just the worst place to be. You just don't know who you are as a team. Um, you don't know what pieces to, and you know, can't you? You don't know what pieces you can and can't acquire. Um, you know, what direction to go in terms of moving controllable assets, rentals, but it just seems like they should have done a little bit more to pick a side. Uh, I think a lot of people would have been fine if they went and yeah. all out bought. And I think a lot of people would have been fine if they all out sold. Uh, and they, they, they traded Jorge Soler and Luke Jackson to Atlanta and they traded Alex Cobb to Cleveland. Uh, they got some big leaguers back. They got Mark Canna in a trade with the Tigers. They got Tyler Madsek back in the Braves trade. But it wasn't anything to make the team significantly better. I think they were better with Soler. You can make that argument. Um, but I would have liked to see a little bit of what they did with, with what the Blue Jays did. You know, just yep. at any piece you think you could have dealt. Uh, Chapman, Snell, um, Chapman, like, you know, People have their opinions of him, but he's leading the team in war. He's got a, almost a five baseball reference war. Um, you know, Chapman and Conforto and uh, Yastrzemski and Soler and all these guys that you think you could deal. Um, Snell and uh, the relievers, too. I think Doval would have been a dark horse in this market, in this relief market. Look at what the the Padres gave up. I think yeah. the Giants could have gotten something back from Doval. And you would have still been fine with your bullpen because Walker's been good. The Rogers brothers have been good. Eric Miller's been good. It's still a pretty good bullpen, even without Duvall. Um, So I, I just would have liked to see more from this team at the deadline, whether it be more buying or whether it be more selling. And honestly, probably leaning towards the selling, kind of what Toronto did. Um, and I understand the whole argument where they're they're one good week away, but we've seen it before and, it's really difficult to build towards the future. So shout out Robbie Lewis. Robbie Lewis, he was leading that one year. Yeah, one, one good week away. One, one good week away. I mean, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I would. I was leaning that I, I hope they would have sold more. I mean, they're four and a half out of the wild card now. They have to hop four teams just to get that third spot. So you're not even just trying to play better ball. You need four teams that are playing good ball to you know basically crap the bed. And so when you subtract whether he should have been in the spot or not, when you subtract your leadoff hitter 
and you bring in Mark Canna to replace him. And you're going to hand most of those DH at bats to Marco Luciano, who, you know, they, they got to see what they got there anyway. But that doesn't really tell your club, we believe in you, that we're a playoff team when you subtract from the current roster. And so that coupled with where they are in the standings, why aren't you selling? You know, it's it just, it, it's been every year since 21 when they went and got, got Bryant, you know, so the last three deadlines now, they've just done a little of both. And I, whether you, you got to choose one way or the other, if you really want to improve your club, either buy to get better now or sell to be better down the road. If you just keep towing the line and you have trouble signing free agents, it's hard to improve your ball club in my eyes. So, you know, I heard they weren't thrilled with some of the packages they were getting offered for Snell, which is, you know, I wouldn't want to just give him away, but he's quick question for you. Do you think Snell's going to opt out? I think if he continues at this rate, yes, I do. I, I actually do. Yeah. I do think that he would opt out at this rate. Yeah. If he pitches this way, his yeah, if he replicates what he's done his last two or three starts through the end of September, then yeah, I could definitely see that too. I mean, Chapman is probably a coin flip. Uh, so why aren't you, you know, and, and, you know, the Soler deal opened up at bats for some guys, even if you're going to be paying Conforto if he's on your roster. So why not even just eat his contract and get a pr prospect or two back for him and open up at bats for other kids. It just, the, the approach didn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, it kind of sucks as a, as a Giants fan going into a deadline, just expecting to be underwhelmed now. Cause that's what we've gotten for three years in a row. Yeah, no, very well said. And even going back to 2019, when the Giants could have traded Bumgarner and Will Smith, I know the Bumgarner thing was kind of like, you know, it might be a little taboo to trade a guy like that. Um, but Smith was one of the better relievers in the game and they had some pieces and they held on to it. And they said, let's, let's do it for Bochi and didn't really get anywhere. But, you know, again, I just think back to Toronto, like they have 15 guys to evaluate. So should we, should we head to the, the ups and downs, Steven? Let's do it. Let's do it. All you. All right. Yeah. I've got, I've got the downs this week uh, and I'm going to talk trade deadline timing. Because I feel like the last few off uh, trade deadlines, we haven't seen a lot of like major names move like we're used to, you know, like bringing up like the Chris Bryant trade again, you know, a former MVP on the move. And I think a lot of that has to do with where the deadline sits now when you have. All right. Sorry, we had a little technical difficulties there in case this thought doesn't fully translate. But what I, point I was getting at was I think they need to give some of these teams you know, they can still make trades at the end of July if they want, but give some of these teams that are kind of toeing the line of, are we in this race or are we not give them a few extra weeks to decide, are we buyers? Are we sellers? And we could see a little bit more, uh, you know, movement, some bigger names potentially getting moved at the trade deadline. I would like to see more time too. I think the third wild card, you know, there's so many teams in there now that the third wild card kind of makes it possible for a little bit more time and the timing to be different. Um, because like you said, these teams just don't know if they're going to be in or not. Uh, and, and I do think there might not be a solution for this only because we're going to get to September, late September. And I feel like it's going to be the same conversation with all these teams in just the same spot. And there's going to be just a boatload of tie breaking scenarios that we're going to have to go through so this is an issue now with teams not knowing what they're doing, but I think it's just going to continue to be an issue towards like the end of September or whatnot. But yeah, I, I do think that a lot of teams might not know what they're doing now, which is why the trade deadline is kind of in an interesting spot. But I think come like late September, I still don't think they're going to be decisive. You know, I, I who knows? Maybe mean, the Giants will still be like, like a, you mean like August, not September? August, sorry, August and so okay. yeah. Let's say like sometime in August. I I don't think it like makes much of a difference. I mean, two weeks of play. Let's say they moved it to like middle October, give them like an extra fifteen games or so. I mean, at least one or two of these teams in each league will probably have kept regressing a little bit, and now they're seven games out of a wild card spot with forty five games left. Uh, so, you know, even if it's just a couple teams there, like, like it, just to use the giants as the example, if we get to mid August and they are eight games out, do you think that changes what Farhan does at all? Maybe 
It does. I think it does. Um, but they also could have been eight games out at this time. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. And then they probably would have sold instead of not doing anything. But yeah, like you said, and the other solution would be to get rid of that third wild card, but baseball's never going to do that. No. Um, so yeah, I, it's something where it's kind of just as a, you know, as a baseball fan's perspective, I think that can make the deadline more exciting. It doesn't mean I don't necessarily think it would happen, but I think that's something that it could at least potentially help it. Um, so yeah, moving on to, to down number two, it's that portion of the program where we have to talk about Mike Trout injury. I feel like it's like every few episodes, there's something new with uh, Mike Trout. He has a, another meniscus tear. He's done for the year. Uh, if he wasn't there already, he's officially Mickey Mantle now, where it's just like, what if this guy could have been fully healthy? I mean, he's already slammed on Call of Famer. So good when he plays. Steven's got his angels mini helmet on maybe he's put on his angels mini jersey from when he was a kid and he had his trout jersey mike trout cup apparently he's got a shrine to mike trout next to his desk but uh you know it, it's really unfortunate that you know because he he started off this year so strong too and just to have that knowing that he still has that potential and Angels fans and baseball fans don't get to see it nearly as much as we should. It's just really unfortunate for baseball. And of course, Mike Trout himself. This sucks. And I know that like it's weighing on him more than anybody. Uh, and like, you're right. He led the entire world in home runs in April. I think he hit like 10 homers in April and it was looking like a really good year for him. And it's, it is looking like Mickey Mantle type stuff. And I think we've seen the last of him in center field. I think if, if he is going to play the outfield again, it's going to be as a corner outfielder, probably left field. Um, it, yeah, it's tough because he's so good defensively. But if his body can't keep him out there, like when do you make the full-time DH? <laughs> yeah, that's on the table too. And it's 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 heartbreaking. Like he's a Hall of Famer regardless of what happens from here on out. But you just like to see him just get a full career and just, I saw so many people tweeting about the games played stats and like in the second half, the last like five years, I think he's played 40 games or something like that, you know, in the second half yeah. across all four years. And it's just, it has not been a good going for him. And you know, the, the meniscus, I don't know like what the, uh, the chances are that you do tear it again, but hopefully there was no rushing involved. Hopefully um, he wasn't feeling the pressure of needing to come back and, uh, hopefully this time he, he's got obviously now the full off season and he could come back in spring training, just ready to roll. But it is sad to see what's happening because the game is better with Mike Trout. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe they go the Bryce Harper route and have him pick up a first baseman's glove. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, and then last down, I mean, potentially the down of downs. It's been a tough few weeks for the white Sox. Uh, I just kind of lead really quick with this other side piece, but you know, first, you know, Garrett Crochet, everyone was talking about he could be the best arm that's moved. And then he came out with these crazy trade demands that if he got traded to a contender, he wouldn't pitch in the playoffs without uh, a, an extension. So that kind of threw a wrench into them building for the future. And the reason they need to build for the future is because they've lost 17 straight games. Uh, unbelievable. I mean, it's it's impressive to lose that many games in a row. It's It's hard to do that. And like, First of all, on the crochet stuff, like, who do you think you are? Like, you know, nobody's really heard your name until this year. Uh, I remember, you know, like, I know Garrett Crochet because, you know, you probably know Garrett Crochet because we're hardcore baseball fans. But let's be honest. Let's be realistic here just a little bit, Garrett, on on what your demands are. So I'm not shocked that that was a turnoff. But, yeah, they have to build for the future because they have no present. Zero present. They have not won a game since, you know, like – july 20th or something way way earlier than that sorry if it's been 17 games um but it yeah. i mean it, it has not been good for them they just they've been a disaster they've been not just bad but like historically bad um and they're looking like they're going to be one of the worst teams ever um so it, it's embarrassing they've needed an overhaul for quite some time we've we've called on an overhaul on this podcast and they just haven't done it clean house. I don't know how many managers you could go through, but um, get someone in there who's going to stay a while, who's going to stay through the rebuild. Uh, but you just need a new look in the front office. And, and it, like Luis Robert, why wasn't he dealt? Um, 
Yeah, they did move uh, Jimenez. They did move Jimenez to where Baltimore, right? Yeah. Um. So, not enough. These teams just aren't doing enough. Like, why is Garrett Crochet not being moved? I just don't understand it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they, they didn't move him because of those trade demands. I don't know any front office that would trade for a guy who's had some injury issues, who's had a solid four months and say, okay, and here's an extension for you, sir. Then you know what? Uh, he, de- he deserves to stay there. Yeah. He deserves to stay there. You know what? You snooze, you lose. Yeah. And you know what? Like me. a few years ago, I remember, you know, the White Sox had this young core that everyone was excited about. And most of those guys are all gone now. And the oh. White Sox are, are terrible. And I just pulled up the longest losing streak in baseball history was 26 games. Do you remember what, do you know what team that was, Steven? The Cleveland Spiders. The, Oh no, they lost the 1899 Cleveland Spiders lost 24. The 1889 Louisville Colonels. <laughs> I mean, uh, we're going like I mean, we're going black and white teams that are, don't even exist anymore. Yeah, so there's 11 teams that have lost 20 or more games and the most recent one was 1988. Most of these are early 1900s, late 1800s. So the the White Sox are approaching if they're not there already, because I'm not sure who's lost 17 to 20, you know, they're approaching having the the longest losing streak in the last 35 years. Yeah. Was 1988 Baltimore? Yep. Yeah. That was the, the call, my friend losing streak to start the season that yeah. um, I know Cal Ripken was a part of, and there was like a sports illustrated to cover. And I wonder what they did at the deadline that year. God. They bought, <laughs> they they bought exactly didn't sell off any of their pieces ripkin stayed no um yeah but yeah. not looking good for chicago nope so you know we'll we'll see how long i'm 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 going to kind of be on white Sox watch now checking the scores every night to see what they're doing but uh that concludes the downs my friend let's let's pick this up and finish on a high note yes let's pick it up let's do exactly that um oh, high note i was uh, waiting for it yeah. So there's, there's a few good ones here. There, there's a few fun ones here that I included. Um, the first fun one that I have and like everybody kind of knows, like there's an unwritten thing to messaging people or, or players on social media. Um, you know, it, it, it it's good if, if you want to say, you know, you hit a home run for me tonight or can you hit a home run for me? Or I just want to say great game. Like it's cool to do all that and like tag them in a tweet or something or DM them. But there's no place in sports for DMing hate stuff to players. And we're we're living in a modern age now where, um, you know, it, there's parlays, there's Vegas, it's illegal everywhere pretty much almost. And there's fans that are watching baseball that have never watched baseball before, but they're doing it for money. You know, and it, it's good that we're getting people into the game, you know, regardless of who it is. But people are watching baseball and following baseball and they have – reasons now to get angry with certain players right if you know a guy doesn't get over two and a half hits that night then whatever anyways the a's have a player brent rooker who is having a good year good outfielder a guy who probably should have been moved to be honest at the deadline um (laughs) and he uh you know is very good on twitter i don't know if you follow him tyler but he's he's been great all year on twitter good personality and somebody dm'd him on instagram and said um you sold me yesterday, one leg away from twenty one thousand, and you could only hit singles, and uh, with like a, a blank emoji. Someone DM Brent Rooker that, and Brent Rooker responded and said, "My brother, I cannot even begin to express how much I do not care." So okay. I want to give it up to Brent Rooker for just you know, the own isn't in you know it was an own that he res- that that you know with what he said it was an own, <laughs> but it was an even bigger own that he responded. Because those people yeah. are not expecting responses for the most part, and Brent Rooker just you know shut it down. And I doubt yeah. I doubt they do care to be honest. No, I mean they don't care if they cost some fans some money. I mean they're out there trying their best to perform. Yeah. It's been uh, the last few years as online gambling has picked up. I've seen countless players say that you know they don't even look at DMs anymore just because they're getting hate from you know random people because. You know, they didn't, like you said, didn't get there over two and a half hits that night. I I think it was, it was one of the Rogers brothers. I think it was Taylor Rogers said he had to change his Venmo because 
uh, he had to set it to private because someone found it and like Venmo requested him like whatever they lost on on their bet because of one of his outings. It's just like it's ridiculous that you know the access that that we have potentially to these players via DMs or tagging them or whatever, and you know with like the online gambling. So you know I would obviously never do that. I don't online gamble or anything. But even if I did, like whatever, dude. Like it's your decision to make that bet make a better bet next time it's not the yeah. player's fault that you made a shitty bet yeah do your research listen to, there's enough content out there that could help you that's for sure um and yeah make a better bet exactly that's kind of like the unwritten rule like if you don't want to see a home run and a bat flip yeah. up a yeah. lot of runs then then pitch better pitch better yeah make a better bet that's a good that's a good way to put it <laughs> tyler i like that yeah. um all right. Well, Jackson Holiday was promoted. This is my up number two. Jackson Holiday was re-promoted. Remember, he got called up earlier in the year, struggled quite a bit. Uh, now he's up again for a second stint, uh, trying to play a big part in this Orioles season. And, uh, you know, his name was thrown out a little bit in some rumors, but I don't think he was really going anywhere. But he gets called up, and he is the youngest player uh, in Orioles slash Browns history to hit a grand slam at the age of 20 years old. And it's his first big league home run. Um, a, uh, a big, a big celebration for him. And he got the ball back. It was a kid that caught it. Um, and his, uh, his, him and his dad met with Jackson holiday after the game. It was a cool, uh, cool moment with a five-year-old kid who is a Maryland native, which is cool as well. Uh, gave him the home run ball back. And uh, one thing that the dad said that was really cool was, if it was my son that hit it, I would want the ball back. Um, so there are some nice people in this world. Um, they they recognize what a big moment it was for Jackson Holiday. Um, and not just a great moment, but a huge swing of the bat, too. He ended up going almost to Utah Street. So um, really cool, cool moment there for, for Jackson Holiday's first big league home run. And you always like to see stories like that. Yeah, it's cool to see guys get reunited with their uh, achievements and you know, I was just happy to see, you know, because he started the year with the Orioles, uh, struggled mightily, got sent back down to to get some more work in. And so to see him, I, th- I don't know if that was his first game back up, it was his first or second, it was very early in his call up. So to see him kind of get that off of his, you know, to get that monkey off his back and I'm sure that makes him feel even more comfortable and more feel like he belongs in the big leagues more. Uh, so, you know, just a cool, cool thing all around from him hitting his first home run to the fans reaction and making sure he gets that ball back. Yeah, no doubt about it. Definitely. And my third up, Brett Phillips, everybody's favorite, um, mediocre baseball player who has a lot of fun playing the game. Who's had some random big moments, Brett Phillips. He's attempting a comeback to the big leagues as a right-handed pitcher. So we know him as the outfielder with Tampa Bay, uh, a few other teams. I think he's played with recently, but, um, had the the huge hit in the 2020 World Series to end a game. Uh, I believe it might have been game four against Kenley Jansen in a crazy play with Randy Rosarena, the aforementioned Randy Rosarena. Um, but he uh, is trying to come back as a pitcher, and he gets a minor league deal to play for the New York Yankees. Um, uh, he was he was with the White Sox organization in January. He was released in May. He did not hit well in AAA, um, but he's now focusing on coming back as a pitcher and apparently in a recent outing um i don't know exactly where he pitched but um he topped out at 90 miles an hour he's got a curveball he's got a split change up uh he even hit 97 miles an hour and um this is what he said to the tampa bay times he said quote i feel like i'm going to pick it up pretty quickly the whole reason i'm doing this is i feel like i could still compete i feel like my body can still allow me to compete and i feel like i could help i love the game and I want to continue to play the game, especially at the highest level. So good for Brett Phillips. He's doing the uh, the reverse Rick and Keel. Yeah, I was just going to say that. And you know, it's crazy. <laughs> it makes me feel so old that a guy who just turned 30 is like, I feel like my body can still compete. <laughs> um, but, you know, we talked about it a little bit before we hopped on here. Is, you know, he's pitched before in his career. He's always just totally had fun with it. And yeah. He would do like funky windups or like look into the plate, yeah. you know, kind and of. And to goofy. everybody out there listening, do us a favor and look up Brett Phillips pitching. It's not the Brett Phillips you would think that just got signed by the Yankees. Yeah, I mean, he's throwing it up there like 40 miles an hour. 
And so, like you said, the, yeah, the, the reverse Rick and Keel, and he's going to try to extend his career. So it is a minor league deal. I don't know if you mentioned that it's a minor league deal for him, but cool to see that he, you know, just shows how talented these guys are that they're like, okay, can't really, you know, I'm not going to work in the outfield anymore. I'll just tow the rubber, see what happens and start throwing 97 up there. So hats off to him, you know, keep it going. Let's see what happens. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because it's like a different minor league deal because, you know, you could sign a 95 to 97 mile an hour guy who, you know, is coming coming from anywhere, right? But the fact that it's Brett Phillips makes it more intriguing for a team probably because he's got the experience of professional baseball. Uh, even though it's not pitching, he's got the experience of being in a clubhouse, you know, all the logistical stuff and... Yeah. It's easier to make that transition with those guys than it is even a pitcher who's been pitching since he was really young. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I know I, there's I, a lot of people out there that might not think it's fair that he's getting signed as you know like a new pitcher, but you know when you have experience, it still matters in this game. Yeah, and you know he played <clears throat> as recently as last year at the big league level too. So yeah. I mean, maybe he's not available out of the pen, and you need an emergency pinch hitter. Let's call that relief pitcher in to pinch. It's a good hit. call. Yeah, good call. So, yeah, he's probably still, you know, got that in his back pocket. Like, definitely still has that in his back pocket. He's still playing in the outfield this year. So, yeah. What um, what level did they assign him to when they signed him? Did you see? I don't think I did see that. Um, it was I'm not sure. Not yeah. sure, but he's he's out of options. So there's one thing that that's where the experience could hurt you. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, he's out of options. He'll probably be a free agent at the end of the year, but it gives him a chance to to pitch for the remainder of the season and work on that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, let, let's see what happens. It'll be it'll be fun for sure to see where uh, what he ends up doing. It looks like he is in. Triple A. Wow. Okay. Oh uh, no, that was still when he was uh with the White Sox organization earlier this year. So we'll see. Sorry to kind of lead us to a dead end there to end the, the episode, Stephen, but well, he's in the minors it... somewhere. Yeah, we shut it down again and we will no. be following Brett Phillips. Yep, number fifty in the books, my friend. Number fifty. We need all the great feedback from Spencer. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Spencer. Anyone else who who's listening. Yeah. And uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. That was on my part. My Wi-Fi will get upgraded. That is a promise. At some point, it will happen um, because it is pretty bad right now. But um, yeah, everybody could go ahead and follow the podcast on Twitter and uh, Twitter at shutdown underscore inning. Go check us out wherever you listen. Um, and uh, we'll have fifty more to go, and probably, hopefully, more beyond that. Uh, a thousand more to go. So we'll be talking in a few years episode 1050 so we'll see you next time that's what's up <laughs>